Coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, we're talking about science on Boing Boing and powering the United States. That's up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour with me, Dr. Kiki, episode 118, recorded Thursday, October 27th, 2011. Science gets boingy. This episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Ford, featuring Wi-Fi connectivity with available Sync and My Ford Touch. Now your car can be a Wi-Fi hotspot. Check it out in the new 2012 Ford Focus and at ford.com forward slash technology. Welcome everyone to another episode of Dr. Kiki Science Hour. I'm Dr. Kiki Sanford and I hope you're ready to dig into an hour of science. You know, we always deliver to you an hour of science, usually one topic, but always one expert at least. And so today we're going to be joined, I hope you're ready to dig in, get a little dirty to some boingy science. Well, the science from science editor Maggie Kurth-Baker from Boing Boing. And she's going to be joining us today to talk about what it's like to be science editor at Boing Boing and also to talk a bit about the book that she has coming out next year on energy and our nation's energy future. Without further ado, let's get into those science headlines. All right, everybody. According to researchers at the Norwegian Institute of Air Research, the Fukushima Daiichi meltdown released double the amount of cesium-137 into the atmosphere than was reported by Japanese authorities. Specifically, that amount was 35.8 petabecquerel, or slightly less than half of the emissions, cesium emissions from Chernobyl. And most of this fell into the Pacific Ocean. Maybe something to be happy about? I, we don't know yet. 10 Camarasaurus teeth taken from Dinosaur National Monument confirmed to paleontologists that sauropods were migratory animals. The analysis used oxygen isotopes to show a change in isotope ratios that was clearly matched to seasonal dry floodplains and volcanic highlands to the west. Sauropods, giant dinosaurs ranging across the plains, migrating like flocks of birds, could have, except on the ground, could have been pretty interesting sight to behold. Climate science skeptic and UC Berkeley physicist Richard A. Muller, along with Berkeley Earth Surface Temperature Project, has published the results of an independent analysis of climate data. These results confirm previous results that global warming is taking place. Once again, no link was found between cell phones and cancer. This time, the results came from a 15-year study of 360,000 Danish people with cell phones and a few million controls. Michael Gillon at the University of Liege in Belgium reported that the exoplanet known as 55 Cancri E is most likely a water world surrounded by an envelope of water. However, don't go making your boat and calling Kevin Costner yet. The water is thought to be in a supercritical state because the planet is so close to its star. As a side note, 55 Cancri A, the star, is visible to the naked eye in the constellation Cancer. And finally, German engineers suggest that invisibility tiles might be more practical than an invisibility cloak to implement. So uh, don't get ready for Harry Potter type cloaks any time time soon, but you never know. You might have an invisible house if you have the right tile guy. This seems like a great time to mention that this episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Ford. One of the latest technologies from Ford Sync with my Ford Touch is Wi-Fi connectivity. This feature can turn your car into a Wi-Fi hotspot, giving you and your passengers instant access for up to five devices at once. 
Establish an internet connection to the Wi-Fi hotspot by plugging in a portable wireless access card from one of the wireless carriers, any one you, you choose, into a USB port located in the center armrest console or the glove compartment or under the radio, depending on which model that you have. Or if you have a BlackBerry, you can connect to the hotspot wirelessly via Bluetooth. Next, connect up, connect up to five Wi-Fi enabled devices to the hotspot using a secure password. You're in. You and your, your driving companions can enjoy this Wi-Fi connectivity. Your passengers, I hope not you if you're driving, can connect their laptops, tablet, mobile phones, other internet devices to the hotspot up to five devices at once to enable them to access music, browse the internet, download apps, or play games via Wi-Fi, all without an additional subscription or expense. Ford Sync with My Ford Touch fe featuring Wi-Fi connectivity is available in the 2012 Ford Focus. You can learn more about this and other technologies Ford is bringing to its vehicles at ford.com forward slash technology. And now let's get back to science and the future of science and energy and being boingy with our guest, Maggie Kurth Baker. She is a freelance science journalist and the science editor at boingboing.net. Her work has appeared in magazines like Discover and Popular Science and online at sites like New Scientist and National Geographic News. She currently has a book in press about the future of energy in the United States. And this is set to be published in April 2012 by Wiley and Sons. Without any further waiting, Maggie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, thank you for having me. You're welcome. It's really great to get a chance to talk with you. I know we've we've run into each other at a conference and kind of been passing science ships on the internet. So it's fun to be able to get a chance to sit down and, and kind of focus and talk about what you do. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that sounds excellent. Yeah. All right. So let's get started with your science background. For people who, you know, might follow Boing Boing or... Um, be interested in the stuff that you post, what what brought you to science writing and, and what is your science science story? So my science story um, starts with me thinking that I was going to go into uh, pre-med when I went to college. Mm -hmm. I'm one of those kids that read The Hot Zone and thought, that sounds like a really great idea. I should totally do that. <laughs> um. it, was a great, it was a great book and I totally, yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> But I got to college and um, essentially kind of chickened out over mm. the math, actually, and ended up double majoring in anthropology and journalism. And I, so I spent four years studying Central American archaeology and also um, biological anthropology and decided I didn't want to go on with anthropology and wanted to focus on journalism, but didn't really know what I wanted to do with journalism. I worked for a couple years for Mental Floss magazine and really enjoyed that, but it didn't have, for me, it felt like I wasn't, I guess, contributing enough to the world. Like I was, I was have, being able to research all these really neat, weird facts, but I didn't really feel like I was helping anybody. And so when I went freelance a couple years later, I decided that I was going to focus on the stuff that seemed to matter more, that I was really into anyway, mm -hmm. and that was science. And there I am. So, so do you, you think science matters? I do think science matters. And I, I think that it's a, one of the things I like about Boing Boing is that I get emails from people telling me that my articles help them understand something better than they thought they could understand it before. And that to me is just such a really great feeling, kind of knowing that I've been a part of somebody's science education. Yeah. What are, uh, what are some of the, the things that people have, have written you about that have been, you know, kind of eye-opening to you that you never, that you didn't really expect a response to? Um, I think one of the things that really surprised me in this last year was that I did a story about what peer review is. Mm -hmm. And I kind of expected that that would sort of be just, you know, something that some people glanced at and maybe some scientists got into, but otherwise I expected it to be ignored. And it was one of the most read things I've had this year. We'd had, I think, mm -hmm. 
upwards of 100 comments, and the comments were every bit as useful to the story as what I had written in the story. You know, people just expanding on some of the things I'd written and asking questions and answering each other's questions. And it ended up having this conversation that I would never have expected people would be that into. Wow, that's, yeah, that's fascinating that, you know, you'd think that maybe... The, the more sensational topics, the the science right. topics that you know <laughs> that have to do with the giant kraken or almost being hit by a comet or you know that kind of stuff that gets people attention would be something that would be more read. Were were most of the comments? Did they seem to be by scientists or did it was it kind of did it seem to be all across the board? People coming it coming out of work. To be- it seemed to be all across the board. Uh, we had a lot of scientists who were in there sort of offering extra information, but there were also a lot of non-scientists who were asking questions, who were kind of trying to take what they had just read and put it into context of, okay, so that's what that means when I read this thing in the newspaper. I didn't realize that before, you know, just kind of adding all of this commentary. Yeah. So how did you get involved with Boing Boing? So when I worked for Mental Floss, uh, right, after I f- right after I quit Mental Floss and became freelance, they gave me the opportunity to write a trivia book for them, which was uh, kind of a lot of different stories from science and politics and history and art and kind of bundled up in a sort of mock self-help guide kind of thing. Right. And part of the promotional I guess, tour for that was a guest blogging stint on Boing Boing. And I just had the best time ever. It was really awesome to have all of these commenters who were so excited about the stuff that I was excited about. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I posted something about my love of subways and got like, you know, a ton of people just like, oh my God, you like trains? (laughs) I love trains. Um, So that was really awesome. It was a great experience. And Six months later, Mark Fronfelder um, called me up and was just like, you know, we're going to hire some contributing editors and we'd love to bring you on. And I didn't expect that that would be something that would work out as well as it did. But right. they actually are just wonderful people to work out for, to work for. Um, they just, they take care of their people so well. It's just been great. That's fabulous. So how does it, how does it work working with Boing Boing? Do you, uh, do you, just have free reign you post whatever you want scientifically yeah it's so it's exciting but it's also kind of terrifying because i don't have copy (laughs) editors i don't have anybody um you know looking at what i'm planning on writing about and telling me whether that's a good idea or not (laughs) it's kind of just all what sounds good to me and then i post it and so what i do is um every day there i post six links to things that are just neat that I see on the internet. So somebody else's story, here's a really cool article you should check out. Here's an event that's going on. Um, And then twice a week, I write a feature, an original feature story that goes up on Boing Boing. And everything is just completely whatever I want to do. I go for it. That's pretty, that's pretty fun. What kind of things do you, do you find really directing your interests? Um, you mean like topics or you mean what I look for beyond the topic of the, you know, the branch of science? Both. Let's go. I, I like both of those. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so I, you know, personally, I know I do a lot more um, things involving biology and, of course, right now, energy and the environment, um, things involving anthropology. I have tried to work in some more physics Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm trying to learn that better. It's one of those things that I'm not as good as expl- at explaining as right. other stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, but I'm trying to expand my horizons and get some more of that in there because I know that the readers love it. And when it comes to what I'm looking for in a story, I really like to have some kind of surprising aspect or some kind of nuance that you might miss otherwise. So, you know, for instance... One thing that was really interesting to me I'm, that I'm hoping to have up tomorrow is a story about a recent study on um, Gulf War syndrome and the causes of Gulf War syndrome. Oh, fascinating. And what made the story really pop to me was that as I started doing some research into you know, how this one guy's theories meshed up with 
you know, the general consensus, I found that it's just a really interesting example of science, good science, not being able to move as fast as individual patients need you know, needs answers. Right. You know, you have these all these people trying to do this research, trying to figure out what the causes are and multiple causes and whether you have, you're dealing with just one illness or whether it's multiple illnesses. And they don't really know yet, but at the same time, you have all these people whose benefits and whose uh, treatment plans all depend on what's coming out of these studies. Right. And there's this big disconnect. And that's something that I just found absolutely fascinating. Yeah, I, I, the... That's got to be that's got to be so frustrating to a lot of people as well. And you've, there's there's a real story in there, right? Exactly, exactly. I love the the places where you get a connection between science and people, and I think that's probably coming from the anthropology background. But mm -hmm. I I love that line. Yeah, you you mentioned you also studied biological anthropology. What's the difference between biological anthropology and just plain old anthropology? Where does that where does that where does the line divide those two? So biological anthropology is, uh, at least the classes I was taking as an undergrad, were a lot more about ev human evolution mm -hmm. um, and our origins and, you know, where we came from. And the anthropology that I was taking that wasn't biological anthropology was a lot more about how human societies developed and culture develops and how we interact with one another even today. Okay. So um, there's lots of different branches of anthropology actually you have um, archaeology cultural anthropology um, biological anthropology those are the three big ones and i know more about archaeology and biological anthropology than cultural anthropology but they all have like these nuances of different aspects of the human experience that they're looking at yeah do you find that uh that your training in anthropology and the way that uh, and, and, and what, what you learned, the process that you learned informs your science writing then? I think it does in a couple of ways. Um, I think probably the biggest, the biggest thing that I've gotten from having that anthropology degree is that it taught me how to read scientific research papers and how to think about, um, how to think about potential flaws or potential questions that I have about how the research was done. And the other big thing I think is that it has kind of taught me to think about, you know, when people are reading this science, what kind of issues might they have with the conclusions being drawn. So it, it's kind of led me to sort of think about the cultural implications and the personal implications of the science. Yeah, yeah. So in like in the case of the, the Gulf War s syndrome and the science that's going on with that, the, 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 the much broader implications of the people who are actually uh, having to deal with the syndrome or uh, and the, the waiting for the science to be done. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of of working with working with Boing Boing and um, and and I mean, it's it's the what is it? What it, it's the uh, the directory of interesting stuff, right? Oh, wonderful things! <laughs> wonderful things! Interesting stuff! Wonderful, wonderful things. things! Yeah, yeah. This is it's one of the one of the top uh, blogs on the internet. Um, how do you how do you find you do you do you get in conversations with say Cory Doctorow or Jeannie or any of the other any other other boing boing writers about some of the sciencey stuff that you're posting? Um, we do sometimes, yeah. We don't have actually a whole lot of conversations on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we probably could have more. Um, but I know that, you know, during the Fukushima stuff, Shani and I were talking an awful lot because she was interested in, um, you know, she has friends in Japan and had known people who were doing some of the uh, citizen science Geiger mm. counter uh Geiger counter tests around Tokyo. And so she and I were talking about the science that I was looking at and the cultural impacts that she was looking at and kind of trying to figure out the best way to sort of mesh both of those stories so that you're not being sensationalistic about either one. And I think that was a really valuable, valuable moment where we were able to have some good conversations. Yeah, I think it's a you know it's always interesting in the in in the media space where you have different people with different interests coming together, um, you know, 
not necessarily writing or, or working together, but is there some some way that they can, um, you know, that science can inform, you know, the cultural side of things? Is there a way that it can also inform the way that the other writers are maybe writing about maker stuff or technology things or, you know, whatever everyone's writing about, whether or not there can be influence? You know, and I, I, I think it can. I don't know for certain whether I've influenced the way that other people write on Boing Boing. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I absolutely love about Boing Boing is that we have this group of people who have such different perspectives on the world and we have really different opinions. You know, you talk yeah. to Corey and I are both really interested in skepticism and in evidence-based everything. But then, you know, you have also David Peskovitz, who's got this long history with like the Fortians and interest in, um, you know, cryptozoology and, and things like that. So he brings this stuff to Boing Boing and, and we'll have people in the comments confused and wanting to know like why this is here you know didn't is this something that's okay with maggie and it, it's yeah. it just makes us laugh because it's something that is not something i would post but i think it's interesting to have that as a part of the conversation and have people thinking about you know applying maybe the critical skills that i'm talking about if they want to to the stuff that david posts so i think it's right. i think that there's value in having those different viewpoints yeah, absolutely. Um, looking at the front page of, of Boing Boing, or at least the uh, the science page on Boing Boing, you have a story up on uh, how much radiation are you exposed to on a plane. Um, have you had a lot of, uh, I mean, we had, you mentioned Fukushima and the, the radiation that was released from, there's a lot of radiation that was released from Fukushima and people are interested in how much exposure they're getting. And then there's the question of radiation on a plane, radiation as we walk through, um, you know, scanning devices at the TSA stops. Um, and what kind of, what kind of conversations have you had about radiation? Are people surprised? I think it's something that is this is one of those topics that is just inherently confusing um, <laughs> <laughs> because I think that it's the what most people know about it is coming from fiction mm. and fiction is kind of inherently wrong on the science um, <laughs> right. so you have all of these expectations about what radiation does to you and where, where you're actually getting radiation from that don't actually mess up match up with um, the reality. And so then you have something like Fukushima happen and you have a lot of people with misconceptions, with confusion, with not being quite sure whether what they're being told is true. And so I think there's a lot of interest in radiation and I get a lot of questions about that in the last few months, particularly um, just kind of people having all these, you know, it seems like every story we post leads to 10 more questions that people have that could be the whole other posts in and of right. themselves. Right. And some of them we have answers to and some of them not yet. Right. <laughs> Most of exactly. them probably not yet. <laughs> exactly. And I ended up I ended up doing this story because I thought it was interesting to know, you know, when people say this is how much radiation you're exposed to on a plane, where those numbers are coming from. And I thought it was just fascinating that there's this organization in France that actually measures this stuff and monitors it and does computer models to estimate the exposures of, you know, long haul pilots and flight attendants. And right. that's where these things that we bring up in, uh, you know, when we're trying to compare something to a Fukushima or to a disaster situation. That's where those comparisons are coming from. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, it's good to, it's good to get that information out there because if you're surprised that there's an organization out there, then you know, the average person who's not looking into this very much, you know, they're probably going to be even more surprised that there, there's an organization right. that measures this, estimates it. Right, exactly. Well, it's interesting because it's, I, I think it's one of those things where you get, you see what happens when different branches of science aren't very interdisciplinary um, because the, uh, the radiation scientist whose trip across the U.S. with a, uh, with a dosimeter, mm -hmm inspired that post um she didn't actually know how those estimates were made you know she had assumed that they were being done years ago possibly with military personnel and wasn't sure that didn't realize that this organization existed either so there there's just all these different things going on even within something like radiation 
all these different branches of science within that that aren't necessarily talking to each other. And this is a great opportunity to connect those two sides. Yeah. So I hope you're, when you find these missing links, you're making those connections, right? Yeah. <laughs> you're emailing yeah. the parties involved and going, you should be talking to each <laughs> other. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, from some other posts that, you, that you've made, the one that was kind of funny recently was uh, the idea of coffee hallucinations. Can you talk a little <laughs> bit about that one? Um, yeah, that was actually a, um, if I'm recalling correctly, a link to um, something that Psy Curious had posted, or am I thinking about something else? Um, I might be thinking about something else here. Oh, I think it might have been Psy Curious. Hold on. I'm scrolling. I had a, I had a link up. Coffee. Oh, Psy Curious was talking about coffee and uh, depression and religion. Uh, okay. Yeah, so there's so many of these coffee. It's all over the place, right? <laughs> what, what does coffee do? It prevents depression. <laughs> it prevents religion. It also causes hallucinations while you sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so that was the caffeine hallucinations thing. Uh, now that I'm looking at it, this was really interesting to me because it was one of those peaks inside science that I think lay people don't get very often um, because you had this random discovery of, uh, you know, people in a uh, anxiety sleep study having hallucinations when they were exposed to caffeine that really had nothing to do with what the guy who was doing the sleep study was studying. So, you know, he just, it just kind of, came up and he thought, oh, that's interesting, and didn't really know what else to do with it other than put it in a letter to the editor at a scientific journal. And then years later, you can go back and look at this letter to the editor has been referenced by a bunch of other people whose re research it actually did apply to. So, you know, even something that seemed just, you know, that could have just been easily shoved into a drawer as that was weird and well, that didn't really matter to us, yeah. was able to be reused and expanded upon later by other people. I think that's a really, a really good point to bring up is that sometimes in the process of doing science, there are findings that, that come up that a researcher may or might, may not act upon and mm -hmm. may, may or may not find interesting enough to actually write something up and submit it. And so, you know, thank goodness there, number one, are these letters that, you, that researchers can write to journals that don't have to be fully fleshed out studies with um, lots of evidence behind them, but just observations or, you know, a small amount of data. Um, and, you know, number two, that, that the researchers are, are interested in doing that. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. You know, it's, it's one of those things that I can totally see people just completely overlooking if you weren't thinking in that mindset of sharing information with other scientists. Yeah. I'd like some hallucinations in my dreams, please. Is that, is that, <laughs> how is that? I mean, do we, the question, the question in the, in the chat room, and I have the same exact question. I mean, if you, you're dreaming, can you have an, a hallucina hallucination while you dream or isn't it just a dream? It was, um, the hallucinations were actually happening as they woke up. So what they were doing was um, having these people who were asleep and then trying to induce panic attacks that would wake them out of sleep because they wanted to see whether you could have a panic attack if your brain wasn't actively in thinking mode. Wow. Uh, right, which is just sounds like one of those horrible torture, science torture devices. How uh, scientists torture people. <laughs> I'm going to wake you up with a panic attack. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and they had um, a couple of some of these patients that had been um, injected with intravenous caffeine. And when, which was something that was meant to produce these symptoms of panic, like, you know, uh, mm -hmm. heart rate, increased heart rate, you yep. know, kind of get them in that mode. Yep. But when they woke up, they reported smelling things that weren't there. Um, and that was the hallucination. The hallucination actually happened after they woke up, not necessarily in their dream state. Right. They, but they were waking up experiencing something that wasn't actually there. It yeah. smells like Pop-Tarts. Where's the Pop-Tart? <laughs> I think they, if I remember correctly, they were talking about like metallic smells or burning plastic. Uh, I might be remembering that incorrectly, but I think that that's what they were. Pleasant. Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. And yeah. 
and then the hallucination itself is just something that was just like, oh, by the way, here, let's put this in a journal. And, and right. since then, there have been other studies that actually played off of this. So there's actually right. been progress that, made. Yeah, yeah. And particularly looking at it for um, studies on migraine hallucinations mm. have used it as a reference. That is interesting because I know, I know people who suffer from migraines, caffeine is often supposed to reduce symptoms. So, oh, interesting. Yeah, so there, that, that yeah. could be an interesting connection there. Mm -hmm. um, so other stories I thought that I've thought were really interesting of yours, there's one that you, uh, you took from a post uh, by Carmen Drawl, who's a really great science writer who works for the American uh, Chemical S Society, right? And she wrote a story on anesthesia that oh that you followed up on just because you were left with questions and you're like hey i'm gonna ask i'm gonna get an interview and ask my own questions <laughs> yeah that um that was such a fascinating thing because that was another one of those moments where i had a oh wow realization you know i didn't mm -hmm. realize that we know it's little about anesthesia as we do and i thought that you know, Carmen Drawl's story was just absolutely great, but there's only so much you could ever pack into one story. And I had all these follow-ups that I just wanted to talk to the scientist about. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I really love about working at Boing Boing is that I have this opportunity to look at what other people are writing and say, well, what questions does that lead me to? I think I need to go in and write something that kind of adds to the conversation rather than just trying to be the first person to the story. Right. That, I think that's, a, that's an interesting way to, to, I guess, add the, the usefulness of, of the blog environment where it, like in journalism, very often it's the first, you want to be the first to the story. Right. Yeah. And in, in your situation, it's not getting the story out there first, but maybe sharing the story that somebody else wrote and then adding and making it even more complex or rich. Yeah, and because the, you know, I don't, I'm just one person essentially. Um, <laughs> so there's a, there's no way that I'm going to beat everybody to the punch on a new story that comes out. But mm -hmm. if I can look at what's being said in the rest of the press and say, well, here's a question that's not being asked or here's an angle on that, that I don't think people are getting to. Mm -hmm. I had this opportunity to turn around and you know, help people better understand the story that they might otherwise only get part of. Right. The story being that anesthesia, we don't know as much as we as you think they do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that in anesthesia exactly. that you trust your life with. <laughs> yeah. No, there's a... Well, for, I, yeah, for instance, I think um, one of the other things that times that I did this that I was really pleased with um, was last year when... Uh, the uh, Gliese 581C, the planet, um, or excuse me, Gliese 581G, right. the potential exoplanet that was found. Right. And the, uh, you know, there were a lot of papers that, a lot of stories that came out about this potentially habitable exoplanet. And one of the things that people came back to is that one of the researchers had been saying, well, I, so it's almost 100% sure that this is, or the chances of finding life on this planet are 100%. My own personal feeling is what he said. Whoa. And, yeah, right. Which, you know, kind of made everybody sort of go, what? Huh? <laughs> um, particularly because they hadn't actually proved that the planet existed yet. Mm -hmm. um, but I was able to look through this paper, you know, as after all of the initial reporting on this story had happened, I was able to go back through and look through this paper and kind of figure out part of what he was doing was trying to use a peer-reviewed research paper as a soapbox to push for more funding for his uh, for this program um, hmm. of looking for exoplanets. Because the, the research paper is actually weird in a lot of ways besides just, you know, this quote that he gave the press. Yeah. Uh, it had some things in there on... Um, it, there was a lot more editorializing than you're used to seeing in a, in a research paper. And it's kind of surprising that it got through peer review, yeah. but you really got to see what his goal was. And his goal was drawing attention to the study of exoplanets and trying to get people to send more money that way. Wow. 
that's fascinating to be able to because the only picture that the main the mass media got out was there's this exoplanet let's be really excited about this exoplanet which is the end result of the the researcher was to get that story right. out there right yeah fascinating a look beneath beneath the hood there on that story for sure um in terms of um <laughs> anything is there anything any other story here that uh that you've posted recently or that just that you think of that was particularly fun to write or really just an interesting interesting foray for yourself hmm um well let me think gosh there's so many of these things that happened that it's uh you know I think one thing that was really fun to write recently I have a series of posts that I actually need to get back to now that my book work is all done yeah. um called science question from a toddler <laughs> where I have solicited readers to send in questions that children have asked them that, you know, those those kind of science questions where you're like, oh, that I, that's an easy, I can answer, oh, no, wait, oh, Ooh, God, I'm suddenly a lot harder. <laughs> really confused. Um, and it started when a friend of mine's toddler asked her whether cockroaches had a penis. And when I actually started looking into that, that was a much harder question to answer than it seemed at first. Um, funny. <laughs> Because they, they don't actually, they have a, don't really have a penis, but they kind of have a thing that delivers spermatophores. So it, it just ended up being this really interesting, uh, interesting look at what's actually going on. And so earlier this year, I, one of the questions that I got was basically magnets. How do they work? Yeah. Uh, which has been, you know, obviously this big joke on the internet since uh, the Insane Clown Posse video. And so what I tried to do was explain some of the basics behind how magnets work. And that was really hard to do yeah. um, because it's that kind of level of physics that starts to make my head spin a little. Yeah. But and so you have, it, to, you have to stop your head spinning so that right. you can get, it, get the information straight to the person who's reading it. Right. Well, it's also, you know, as a journalist, it's also interesting to find sources for a story like that because yeah. it's, to the scientists that study it, it's such a basic thing that it kind of almost feels weird calling up a physicist and being like, so how do magnets work? <laughs> right. and, so, and, yeah. You work on this, you know, particularly important problem in the universe, but uh, how do magnets work? <laughs> right, yeah, you, you have this very specific thing. Let me ask you about something really general. Yeah. Um, and so it was It was just a really interesting story to report on and a really interesting thing to wrap my head around. And I think that, you know, we really came out having something that at least made part of magnets make more sense. Yeah, yeah. But the thing, the, the truth behind the whole magnet story is that physicists really when it comes down to exactly how they work right <laughs> they don't really know <laughs> exactly and that was actually the best part about it was that there's you know you can go back and back and get smaller and smaller but then at a certain point it's kind of like and then it just does and then it just works and we know it works yeah. <laughs> and we know what it does but we don't know exactly how. <laughs> which i think was also just a great you know tying in with that science question from a toddler thing like at a certain point well it's just because i say so just because. <laughs> and in this case, you can, ask, magnets. you can keep asking why, but at a certain point. Because I say so. <laughs> <laughs> Victoria, I say so. Yeah, that's, that's a fat, that's fun. I love the, I love the idea of getting, but these questions that are pretty simple questions at the heart of it, but can end up being much more complicated. I like that. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah. And there's also the humor factor of you never really know what's going to come out of a toddler's mouth. So, Right. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of, the, I'm sure the questions that you could potentially get are fascinating just there. <laughs> Another one of my favorite ones was, um, the question was, hello, baby, is it dark in there? Like some something that the toddler had asked their mother's pregnant stomach. And oh. I ended up doing a story on how scientists have studied um, sensory perception in unborn fetuses. Right. You know, how we know what fetuses can actually hear and smell and taste. And it, some of the research on that was just so interesting. I mean, there was one researcher I talked to who what he did was have these anesthetized rats. And this is 
going to really horrify people. <laughs> Some people, yeah. It, Go yeah. for it. Anesthetized rats that then he took the wombs out of them and then like very carefully cut open the womb and took out the embryo and had the embryo still attached by umbilical cord but floating in a um a solution that solution yeah that like mimicked the environment of the womb probably right yeah right and then they were able to study reflexes and um responses to sound that way wow which yeah which is just such a it's one of those moments where I, I have these moments where you have like two different competing feelings mm-hmm. and I feel like that was one of those moments for me where I was simultaneously thinking, wow, science is awesome. And wow, that's kind of fine. That's kind of, um, wow, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, I don't really know which way to go on that, but it kind of, I feel both things. Um, and then the, but that research, you know, this kind of, this fascinating, horrifying research has been really invaluable in helping us um, protect and better treat premature infants. Right. Because a lot of them have, you know, very similar, not quite developed senses, and you can actually damage that stuff if you're treating them like a full-term infant. So mm-hmm. we've learned a lot better how to take care of them because people have been doing, you know, these rat studies. Right. So on the horrifying side of things, you know, sure, it appears that way, and you know, if taken on its own, it possibly is. But then, the, you know, the bigger picture of what that work actually helps us do is so important. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh gosh, kids ask the great greatest questions. They actually. really do. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, toddlers. <laughs> um, other other stuff that you've been into, you mentioned also that you've been working on this book, and I know you've been working on it for quite yeah. a while. Tell us a little bit about about the book title. Um, what should people be What should people people be looking forward to? So the book is called um, Excuse me. Before the lights go out, and it is really meant to kind of have a big picture on energy. So, you know, you read in the newspaper about all these tiny little individual projects, like here's a wind farm, there's somebody's solar panel. And what I wanted to do was pull out and look at what all these little things are adding up to and what are these big trends that are going to be shaping the future of energy for the next, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. And I was able to do just some great... um, both storytelling and kind of explanatory how this works science reporting that I absolutely love. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because the three big things that I ended up focusing on were uh, the rebound effect in energy efficiency, which is this tendency to, as you save energy through energy efficiency, to actually end up using more energy in other ways. Yeah. Um, And there's so much interesting stuff there because it's something that economists have only been studying empirically for maybe 15 years. Hmm. So there's so much we don't actually know about it um, and how big the rebound actually is. And so that was one of the things I ended up doing a lot of reporting on in this book. Um, The second thing was the lack of storage in our electric grid. I think a lot of people don't quite realize that you pretty much always have to have an exact balance between the amount of electricity going into the electric grid and the amount going out. Mm -hmm. And there are people sitting in facilities all over the U.S. right now who monitor that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, forever and ever and ever, because that balance is just completely precarious. Yeah. And that was just amazing and because of that that affects you know the amount of wind and solar power that we can use right now until we add things like storage or until we add things like better transmission and better distribution grids you know it it affects what we can and can't do with energy Um, and then the third thing was the decentralization of energy Mm -hmm. so going from having you know this one massive power plant in the middle of nowhere to having things that are more on the scale of, uh, you know, communities or s- states or regions of states. So you can use some of these resources that you might not be able to actually access if you're trying to just do everything big. Um, I think my favorite example of this is that my home state of Kansas currently has about one megawatt of hydroelectric capacity. So just, you know, piddling, nothing. Um, 
but if we were able to have more small scale hydroelectric dams, um, you know, things that are just maybe just a dam in the middle of the river that doesn't necessarily need a reservoir built behind it, or even hydroelectric power without dams, you could get that up to about 300 megawatts of hydroelectric capacity. So just the amount that you could capture by decentralizing is just enormous. In terms of going between the, the book writing and the, and the blogging that you do, which one do you, do you prefer? Which one do you, do you find more rewarding? Oh, gosh. Um, I think that probably depends on where I am in the process. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> right? I think if you would ask me that in May, when I was kind of knee deep in book edits, I would have said that the blog felt more rewarding. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> I'm kind of at a point right now where it's coming back to a nice balance. I think that the book does things that the blog can't do, and the blog does things that the book can't do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I miss when I'm writing the book, that instant feedback of, you know, letting me know what people are understanding and what they aren't understanding and pointing me in these directions that right. I, you know, don't get from book writing. Mm -hmm. But on the blog, I miss being able to get in depth and get long in a way that, you know, you just, you can't fit 80,000 words into a blog post. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, one of the, one of the, the, points in your book uh, has to do with storage and this mm -hmm. comes to the difference between blogging and book writing um, the story that came out this week uh, I think there was a blog post on Scientific American uh, their their blogs about um, a researcher who wants to use electric cars as batteries yeah. for the grid yeah yeah and I think that's Willett Kempton out at the University of Delaware mm -hmm. yeah yeah, and he's actually in my book. Um, cool. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's a really interesting um, a really interesting solution. And the problem that he's trying to solve is how you get enough people buying electric cars fast enough mm. so that you can have this storage built into the grid as fast as you're actually going to need it. Um, because without these major upgrades. Um, what the experts tell me is that we can get between maybe 20 and 30 percent wind and solar energy on our grid before we have to make these upgrades right uh, and that's about it and there are states that are on track for that you know within the next 10 years but the american car fleet doesn't turn over that fast mm -hmm. so um one of the things that people are working on is trying to allow people who drive electric cars and use those to balance uh you know, this uh, supply and demand fluctuation on the grid allowed them to be paid for that service the same mm -hmm. way that uh, traditional electric generators are paid for that service today. So by aggregating them all, aggregating a bunch of drivers together into one giant battery and selling right. that to electricity companies. Wow, that would be yeah. really interesting. So not it's like getting solar panels, kind of, you get paid for having your electric car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, and that's what that's what Kempton is working on in Delaware is ways to make that um, integration process better so that you can have more people buying more electric cars faster. Yeah, there's a huge there. The, probably the big thing also is subsidies. I mean, getting people to buy. There's only so much money out there, and you need if you really want something to happen fast, you have to subsidize, right? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, I have tried not to go a whole lot into the subsidy thing mm -hmm. uh, simply because what I'm most interested in in the book is science. As opposed to the economics. Other, as opposed yeah. to the policy, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think that, yeah, subsidies are one of those things that if you want stuff to happen fast, there's something that helps make it happen fast. Yeah. Or at least faster. Faster for sure, yeah. although they're very highly controversial. Definitely. Uh, <laughs> yeah. In the, in the process of, of writing your book, were there any, um, you know, any moments where scientifically just you, you looked at the science and you just, uh, just were either over, not, I don't want to say overwhelmed, but is, is there, were the, was there a point where, that you were just excited about something, super excited about something you were learning about? 
I was really, really excited about the grid control centers, um, you know, where these guys sit and monitor the flow of electricity around the grid. Mm -hmm. I just found that to be a completely fascinating sort of underbelly of our society in a way that we never talk about and never acknowledge. You know, everybody thinks that their electricity is these little elves that live in the wall. Um, I turn on the, I turn on the, turn the switch, <laughs> off, turn the switch down. Yeah. You know, and it comes on, it comes off. Um, but I got to go to, uh, to Texas outside of Austin a couple summers ago and tour one of these grid control centers. And, you know, there are these guys that sit in there on Christmas Eve, on New Year's Eve, every day of the week. And they're just there trying to make sure, putting out all these tiny little fires that are happening constantly. Yeah. You know, they don't even have alarms on anything because the guy told me if they had alarms, they'd be going off so often that people would just start ignoring them. Uh, so it's just, just that realization of how precarious yeah. our electric grid actually is was just, I don't, I, exciting maybe is the wrong word, but it was exciting. You know, it was, uh, it felt like I was discovering something really cool. And and you were for sure. I mean, the, the, ins, the inside the guts of how stuff works, I mean, that's, you know, yeah. something that not a lot of people get the opportunity to take a look at. And so when you get the chance to look at it and then share it, it's it's like, hey, look what I found. This is neat. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I got the chance to go up to uh, Northwest National Labs outside in Washington State. Mm -hmm. And they have a grid control center there that's like a backup. So oh, nice. That, so that in the, in the event of an emergency, they take over like some some northwest quadrant or something <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was impressive like the pictures from your blog there are all these uh uh all these screens that they're looking at maps of the united yeah. states map you know graphs and different different spreadsheets i mean it's absolutely like that there's just this information just information flow well in the book i ended up describing it as feeling like I, I felt like I was walking into a temple because you had this, you went from this bright, you know, normal office space through all this security into this mm -hmm. giant, you know, high ceiling, dimly lit, quiet, quiet room. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, like when I was listening to my um, recordings afterwards, you could tell when we walked into the actual grid control center room because all of a sudden everybody started whispering and mm -hmm. it, it, it felt like walking into a cathedral. It was just really overwhelming. Oh, that's fascinating. Energy, the cathedral of energy. The, it really is, <laughs> seriously, it's like the, the stuff that powers our lives, that allows us to do everything that we do, that we take so much for granted. Um, how did energy become such a big topic of interest for you? What, what turned you into you know, the information hound that you had to be for this topic? So it actually began because my husband is works in the energy industry. He um, is an energy efficiency consultant. So he, what he does is use computer models to make buildings as energy efficient as possible for the least amount of money. Okay. Um, and so he was coming home, you know, talking about all of these issues about how uh, you know the, the importance of energy efficiency, the problems that people run into with integration of uh, renewables into the grid, you know, all these things that to him were completely old hat and were becoming old hat to me. But I kept remembering, like, I didn't know this. I don't think most people know this. I think there's so much here that most people don't actually know and that the experts know and that they're not making that connection of, you know, what we actually need to tell people. Yeah. And that was what really led me down the energy path was, you know, just realizing how little I knew about this and how little even friends of mine who are, you know, big environmentalists, how little they knew about how this system worked and mm -hmm. wanting to kind of, you know, help people better understand that. I think it's great. So your book comes out in April of 2012, but people can, yes, it does. People can pre-order uh, copies mm -hmm. through Amazon. Um, so if you're interested, look for Before the Lights Go Out, Conquering the Energy Crisis Before It Conquers Us, Us by Maggie Kurth Baker. It says the title has not yet been released, but we'll take your order. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll write down your name. We'll send you a copy when it comes out. But it sounds, it sounds really fascinating, and I, I look forward to giving it a good read when it comes out. Absolutely. 
Well, good. Yeah. Um, so I think that about does it for our hour. I'm looking at the clock and we're, we are we are coming up on an hour here. Is there anything else that any directions that you want to want to send people any tidbits of wonderful things that you'd like to leave them with before you go? Um, you know, off the top of my head, not really. I know I would say that the one thing that I'm kind of starting to get more interested in now um, as I've finished up this book, uh, agriculture science is really fascinating to me right now. Mm. Um, particularly, I'm really interested in like how humans have changed plants over the centuries, how you went from something like, you know, something that was a bushy grass, like what you'd see out front of somebody's house for landscaping to corn, mm. how we changed this so massively just by breeding. I find that absolutely fascinating, and I think that might be some of the directions that I'm going in the future for, um, you know, big project research. Yeah, it's it, it sounds like it's got the human angle, the anthropology, the biology, the science. Yeah. Awesome. I look forward to blog posts that start pointing us in the direction of this new interest. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, everybody who is interested, uh, you can look for Maggie's posts over on boingboing.net. You can go to the science section specifically, or you can go to boingboing.net tag and science for more information, more of her posts. Um, and if you're interested in her book on energy, make sure you pre-order a copy over on Amazon. Maggie, thank you very, very much for joining me today. This has been a lot of fun. It's been really interesting getting to getting to take a peek inside your, your science-y life. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been great to, to chat with you. Yeah, it's been really fun. I'm sorry that we weren't able to get the video working, but your picture was very nice. <laughs> Good. I, I'll tell my photographer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Relay the word. Okay, everybody. So that about does it for our show today. Thank you very much for watching. Um, I will be back next week. And next week we are going to be, um, I believe we're going to be having a guest who is also speaking at the Bay Area Science Festival. Next week is the Bay Area's first ever science festival there are events happening all over the bay area so if you are in the bay area or if you're going to be visiting the bay area make sure you check out bay area science i think it's bay area science festival.org or just look for bay area science festival online in a search engine of your choice then you'll be able to find it. There's a great schedule of, of events that i'm going to be running around to some of them i will be broadcasting i'm going to hope to be getting this going. I'm going to be broadcasting live on Justin TV uh, on my channel, Justin TV slash Dr. Kiki. I'm going to be doing some behind the scenes interviews of scientists and speakers at the event. And I hope to be able to bring you some of the stuff that, that we're doing live. It'll be fun. I hope that you join me for that. Um, and if you're around, go find your own events of science goodness that you, uh, that you want to enjoy. And if you're not in the Bay Area, I'm sure there's something sciencey happening near, near you. So your homework assignment for next week is go find something sciencey to do. Have fun in your, with science in your life. Um, but until next week, you can follow My Sciencey Pursuits on Twitter. I'm at Dr. Kiki. Facebook, Google Plus, I'm Kiki Sanford. I haven't changed it to Dr. Kiki again yet. Or um, you can subscribe and listen to, you can subscribe to Dr. Kiki Science Hour in iTunes, or you can go to twit.tv forward slash Kiki, and you can find all sorts of past episodes to view in the mode of your choice. I will see you next week, and I do thank you very much for tuning in to my Science Hour. All I ask is one hour a week, and I hope that it makes your world a whole lot more interesting. And now for your science meditation of the week. Yeah, the video that we were just watching was, um, it was a video of a, the sighting of a large single-celled organism called xenophyophores down in the Syriana Trench. And the xenophyophores are, have been, uh, they're kind of protozoan, possibly amoeba-like, um, however, we don't know for sure. There's a lot unknown about these giant single-celled organisms, like, well, maybe not that big, four inches across. 